Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray, and today I am joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. And today we are going to be interviewing uh, Matt Arbog, a member of BitRefill and uh, creator of Useful Tulips. Um, and we're going to be discussing the news, including the IRS requesting Kraken's tax records and much more. So stick around to hear that. Um, but first off, before I introduce you, Matt, Ricardo, Jerry, how are you guys doing quickly? How's things going with you? Oh, I'm doing good. I'm healthy again. No more cold. Uh, feeling fantastic. Nice. Glad to hear it. Jerry. Uh, pretty opposite to what Ricardo's feeling. I'm feeling a bit down today, but, you know, I'm hopefully <laughs> I'll shake it off. Yeah. Not so glad to hear it. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I've had like a weird few days. I don't know. Like I, I started getting a sore throat and then like getting really weak and dizzy just sitting down. And then it just, but then that was yesterday and then it's just gone. And I'm like, what? Yeah, that's weird because I was, you know, pretty much having sore throat and the last two days and I just, you know, got over the sore throat and now I'm having some kind of weird headaches. Yeah, man. man. Hopefully it's not the new Corona, you know, variant or whatever that is. <laughs> Quadruple, five tuple, like uh, going to kill everyone variant. Yeah, maybe, hopefully not. Um, but yeah, I guess, Matt, well, I'll, um, before I ask how you're doing, I'll try and give you a quick intro, but obviously you can introduce yourself a bit better if you like um, before the interview. Um, but yeah, so Matt is a data scientist. Uh, he's creator of UsefulChips.org um, and a very valuable member of the BitRefill team. Um, and you're from the US. That's probably all I know about you. Um, I think I can give it everyone. Um, so how are you doing today, Matt? How's things with you? Yeah, I'm doing good. Um, I'm uh, in my uh, camper in middle Missouri. Uh, you can see the nice background and it's a beautiful day out. So it's been good so far for me. Sounds perfect, man. Sounds perfect. Living the camper life. I like it. Um, well, I'll say what we'll do then we'll, we'll crack on straight into the, into the news, uh, get cracking. And then after that, obviously we'll speak to yourself. No game this week as to be honest, I just want to get onto, you know, the interview and that sort of things. So yeah, to kick us off, um, Ricardo, uh, please. Give us your, your findings for this week. My story is Marathon Mines Bitcoin block that's verified as compliant with U.S. regulations. And Marathon is a mining startup uh, based in the U.S. And they mined their first clean block five days after the company began directing 100% of its 10.37 exahash per second to a compliant mining pool that they are pioneering. Basically, what they're doing is censoring transactions from people that are on a watch list. Um, it's called the Specially Designated Nationals and Block Persons List. So people that they censored were some Iranian nationals whose wallet addresses were, were already blacklisted. But they are trying to only mine clean blocks that are fully AML KYC transactions, and they're censoring non-AML KYC transactions. And uh, for years in Bitcoin, we've been hearing about tainted coins and the lack of fungibility in Bitcoin, but that's always been like at a user wallet level, um, censoring transactions and tracking AML KYC for transactions um, from a mining pool level is something that's new. And Marathon is also inviting other mining companies that want to be uh, quote unquote compliant to join their pool. So this may be a trend that we see a lot more of as more, more corporate companies, financial companies, uh, Wall Street type companies come into the market and want to be fully regulated. One thing you on said this. that uh, I didn't fully understand is you said it was they're doing full KYC AML. I don't know if that's necessarily true. Did it say that in the article? Because as far as I understand, you can, uh, you know, they, they have they might have a, a list of addresses that you know they're not allowing to propagate across the network but are you telling me that they've done uh, KYC AML on every single entity on, on that particular block because I don't know if that's actually happening uh, well I'm I'm not sure a hundred percent about the details but this is a direct quote from the article it says in abiding with AML and OFAC standards marathon is effectively censoring people from participating in the network. OFAC has historically taken action against Bitcoin wallet addresses, like you said, associated with sanctioned individuals. The office's first publication of that kind involved two Iranian nationals described as individuals that U.S. persons generally are prohibited from dealing with. Um, yeah, so it's not it's not that they're it's not that they're running a check on every single transaction. It's simply that they're checking all the transactions and seeing if any of them um, are related to these blocked lists. So. 
Um, as far as I understand, that's what they're doing. I saw Marty Bent posted some interesting stuff about this yesterday. Apparently, uh, there were li very little fees, and then there was even um, I forget exactly what it was, if somebody can find that tweet, but um, apparently people were putting kind of metadata troll inside of the block as well, uh, uh, that type of stuff. So yeah, it's very unpopular with the maximalist crowd for sure. Yeah, I can uh, I can see why. I hate it. <laughs> I uh, It just goes against the whole, the whole point in the first place for me. So I despise the idea and I think it's ridiculous. Um, and yeah, I saw you someone... see this causing like a fragmentation in the chain between tainted and untainted coins? Oh, oh, I hope not. <laughs> I, really, I really hope not. Um, yeah, I think in the long term, it's absolutely a possibility. I think more so in the um, uh, the the exchanges that, that could adopt... Uh, I forget what it what it, what it's called, but in the banking, um, in the banking uh, networks, uh, they have to forward the information of their customers to the other banks. Uh, yeah, that's the travel bank, rule. The travel, oh, the travel rule. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. So that type of thing, I think, could definitely be very impactful, and it could definitely lead to kind of two bitcoins riding upon the same blockchain. Um, you know, clean clean versus unclean coins or whatever. So definitely oh, possibility. Gosh. I know that um, the travel rule thing is, is coming. Um, mm -hmm. FATCA is, is an international think tank and like policy um, guideline organization. And when they recommend um, financial institutions to implement policies, uh, we typically see like all the financial institutions implement these policies and the travel rule is one of them, so. I, 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 did, I did remember certain theory, you know, there was, you know, going about, especially when um, Sailor was, you know, packing up, racking up, you know, Bitcoin. And certain people are saying that, you know, I think there's a possibility that in the future that um, um, Sailor, you know, might, you know, launch an exchange or, you know, a Bitcoin custody firm where they'd be selling, you know, um, compliant, you know, regulatory compliant Bitcoin. And, and at a certain point in time, there'd be, you know, prices for two different prices for tainted coins and untainted coins so uh, you know then it just seemed to be like a conspiracy theory but you know with the way things are going you know you never can tell i think it's definitely going to um the michael sailors of the world and the raul pals of the world those types of i mean they're definitely not the same type of person that's for sure but um the these larger uh the people who have the ideology that Bitcoin's value is in its scarcity and in its uh, fixed issuance, and they believe that that is the thing that, that brings Bitcoin its value, that's a very different school of thought from other Bitcoin people who believe that censorship resistance uh, is, is uh, a very key component. And there's definitely going to be a clash between uh, the different groups of people that prioritize uh, which of these things is most important in the future. And I could definitely see some sort of like um, uh, SegWit 2x kind of level of controversy or even larger where um, you see a fracturing of Bitcoin uh, where one group goes down the, the privacy direction um, uh, and then, and then the other group kind of tries to be more polished and Wall Street friendly. In my personal opinion, I think Bitcoin is a failed experiment if it is no longer permissionless, and if it is completely tracked and surveilled and taxed. Um, to me, then it, it's dead, and we should fork it and try to make a better version of it. Like, uh, like uh, Matt did say, you know, at the point that I'm, there will be or probably might be, you know, a clash, you know, between two different ideologies or or different you know, views of you know bitcoin and we do have the sailor taps and we do have the you know the idealist type who see bitcoin as a way to you know as basically uh, as a way to undermine you know government authority so um well it's really hard to say what's going to happen in the future but uh i think this could you know like matt just say we could have another segue type you know segue to x type of you know, situation when you know people begin to when we when we reach the point where we say okay we need bitcoin to go you know full you know become fully you know private in the way we you know transact and store our bitcoin 
and obviously this is not going to go, go down well with uh, with uh, men in suits. So I think that would be the climax of you know where I think we are heading to at this point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now I, I would suggest we just say to all the people who want fully compliant Bitcoin stuff, this, this thing called BSV, really great. You guys, if you're listening out there, just go to that. Okay, I've heard wonderful things. Um, I can tell you it, it must be fantastic because it's what Satoshi wanted. You guys go to BSV and then everyone else will just stay with Bitcoin. That, that would be appreciated. That's what I'd like to say. So all the Michael Saylors and, and the, uh, the banks out there. Satoshi, for instance, do, do you think he would, what would you think Satoshi would prefer? You know, um, because I would, he prioritized, you know, 21 million BTC and, you know, uh, people having, you know, the predictability of, you know, Bitcoin's, you know, financial, you know, uh, monetary policy, or would he, you know, prefer, you know, the idealist route of, you know, people, you know, Bitcoin as a tool to undermine government, you know, um, government, you know, um, authority and in that way. Yeah, it's a good time to ask me because I just listened to um, Pete Rizzo put out some stuff on uh, the early days of Satoshi and, and um I don't know if you guys have been following, but he, he put out a long piece on that and went on a couple of podcasts. But I think, uh, so I understand a little bit more about kind of what Satoshi was about. And um, I think Satoshi, he definitely, uh, he definitely was both of those directions. I think he really respects the idea of a digital gold. Um, uh, he understands the value of scarcity. He, he, he listed his birthday um, on, on the Bitcoin doc forum, he listed his birthday as the same day that um, uh, I believe uh, Nixon um, kind of completely took us off of the gold standard. Um, uh, so he, he very much understood the value of this digital gold concept, but at the same time, he's also a cypherpunk and um, uh, I believe uh, to a degree believed in um, you know, centralist transactions. And he, he mentioned that, uh, you know, w- uh, WikiLeaks would be, uh, it, it, Bitcoin could be a possible vector to fund WikiLeaks and other types of anti-government things. Um, so uh, I don't know. I think, you know, the, the thing that I learned from that, uh, what Pete Rizzo put out is that, you know, um, although he, this person was a very, very smart person <clears throat> and they really did have like a gigantic body of knowledge, uh, not only on the technical side, but on the political side and the historical side, they really understood a lot of things. They still were not perfect and they still were, there were, there were things uh, early, early in the Bitcoin days where Satoshi was recommending that there was some sort of like board of decision makers um, that that should determine the monetary policy and that is completely against what we believe today or you know we believe that the 21 is the number that we're going to be at um he um I, and maybe somebody will correct me if i'm wrong but um about his thoughts on that but uh yeah so i, I don't know i think he I don't know if I have a great answer, but I think he definitely was in both of those directions. He, he respected both of those properties a lot. I think that he was, he was somewhat of an idealist for sure, because there's a quote and I, I'm, I know I'm going to butcher it. So I'm going to paraphrase it, but he talks about how Bitcoin may not be like the perfect solution, but it has bought us some time mm-hmm. to, to kick it down the road a little bit for freedom. So, um, I know that was a, a, a huge concern of his was that Bitcoin would be a system to to uh, increase people's personal freedom. Mm-hmm. Right about the piece, uh, Matt, it's really good. I, re- I read that the other day. It took a little while to like fully kind of take it all in, <laughs> but there's a lot. There's a lot there. It's a long, long um, piece. But I think like the the beauty though of the whole thing is that it doesn't really matter what Satoshi would have wanted, does it? At the end of the day, like he mm-hmm. created it and. Even like, because you can see even from that piece that he's like losing kind of control over time of it. Exactly. And that's kind of almost what he wanted anyway, we think. I mean, it's obviously not, you know, you never really know, but um, it's like he's kind of losing that control. So it's kind of almost, almost like, uh, it's kind of good that we don't really know. And, and to be honest, like, you know, mm-hmm. the whole the whole beauty of it is that it's not, doesn't matter what he wants. It matters what everyone else, like the, the general majority wants. Yeah. That's kind of like the good thing about it. It was, it was another, another point that Pete made, or I think that he was trying to make was that, and this speaks to game theory in general in that 
in the earliest days of Bitcoin, it did require kind of a benevolent dictator to call the shots. Um, and he, he did fill that role. But as you said, he did start to be kind of outclassed almost in certain areas of, of the project where these other people were coming in and actually showing far more awareness or knowledge in a particular area. And so he was, um, yeah, uh, uh, being, being kind of taken over in, in some respect. Um, so yeah, it, what that says is, you know, when things are in their very infancy, sometimes they do require that benevolent dictator, but, you know, at some point there has to be a transition to uh, nobody is in charge type of model, which is somehow we've kind of almost made it to that point there are certainly massive influencers on what does eventually happen. But uh, yeah, it's, it is, it's fascinating to see how this whole project has evolved and how certain things that they thought were going to be super popular are not that popular. And then certain other things that, um, you know, they were talking about, there was, there was only a few people in the very early days that believed in this, like um, the Saifedean, uh, uh, theory of, of um, you know, the, the, the monetary policy, the, the, the fact that it aligned so well with Austrian economics and, th and that type of thing. And, but now that's like super mainstream. So um, yeah, it's very interesting to see how, how it really does, the whole project does evolve um, as, it, as it exists in the world, it kind of changes and adapts and rolls with the punches and um, goes where it's needed and, and changes, so. Yeah, and what you said, I guess, about like it being centralized and then kind of handing itself off, you can see how like, it's, it's, it's probably nearly impossible to from the get go have like a truly 100% decentralized project that just that's it from the get go, right? It's got to be tough as hell to be able to do that, if not impossible. Um, yeah. And you can see this from all the other altcoins, right? Like, how many do you see that have ambitions to be decentralized down the road or whatever, but actually there's like a whole roadmap to get there, right? And, yeah. and a lot of them haven't become decentralized and yeah that's kind Only of a point ethereum has though. become sufficiently decentralized i mean i wouldn't well, even that's... necessarily agree with that but you know <laughs> there you go and Bisley <laughs> still runs the show right like you know, the miners don't want proof of stake yet he's forced proof of stake on all the miners you know i mean it's like is that even decentralized but yeah i don't know i mean there's all these different coins and some are obviously arguably more centralized if there is a scale than others mm -hmm. but yeah um i guess i don't know it's probably a good time to move on to the to the next news piece so i'm gonna throw it at you guys um and yeah mine's from coindesk it was a piece uh, that is titled irs approved to seek records of kraken users transacting over 20k in crypto um so this was the uh, the u.s federal uh, courts um, authorized the move i think it was this this wednesday um so essentially uh what the um, irs is which is the the tax man i guess in the, in the u.s is probably the best way to put it i believe anyway i'm not from the u.s um so they are trying to catch tax dodgers essentially and people who aren't paying their capital gains taxes um and so what they've done is they've obviously requested um kraken uh, and their subsidiaries uh, provide all uh, data on uh, any of their users transacting of 20k i think obviously they've said no or they've kind of resisted a little bit and obviously they've now been forced by the courts to do so now i wouldn't say this is like the reason i bring this up i wouldn't say this is necessarily a super surprising thing i guess um from my perspective but i think the reason i'm bringing it up is that like what, what i wanted to say i think mostly on on this podcast was that like and then this is coming from someone, by the way, who is establishing and kind of running in the early stages of a centralized exchange. <laughs> so I, this is coming from me, okay? But um, you the sign that everyone needs to consider is that when you are transacting with a centralized exchange or centralized broker or centralized body with cryptocurrency, whether it be Bitcoin, Monero, whatever the hell it is, you are probably, it's probably 99% certain that, that that information, those transactions will end up in the hands of a government at some point in time uh, mm. if you're not doing it uh, peer to peer basically um, so I think like the key here was like to show people um, it's kind of like with the back doors in Apple and Android and you know when we had the leak from Snowden of oh wait a second you know if the FBI are watching our web cameras they're probably watching this right now and all this stuff it's to show that like you know with crypto I think a lot of people seem to think still even people who've been involved for a little while and feel like they know what's going on there's always that thing you kind of forget about but like if you are using a centralized exchange you're going to get caught if you're not 
basically paying your taxes and you are going to have your information out there with the government. And that's obviously clear from this, right? We can see the court has actually said this, you know, it's set a precedent already, basically, that crypto exchanges will have to provide on request to the IRS, basically, in the US is kind of the precedent that's been set here. Um, I didn't know your guys' views, but I just wanted to kind of make that point. It's something that people forget a lot. I forget it as well, but um, it's a point to make. I'm not surprised at all because uh, Kraken has like a federal banking license. So they're going to be 100% compliant with any uh, federal and local uh, state laws also. So Yeah, that's true. Um, but I say, I don't know if I've heard necessarily, and I may have just missed, but I don't know if I've heard of other exchanges uh, kind of going down the route of disputing handing over um, requested documentation. I, I, I haven't heard necessarily heard of yeah the IRS requesting... Right. All documentation from uh, from on, on the users before or any other exchanges users. The whole thing with Coinbase for I think it was a year or two ago, and they were yeah. doing something very similar. We want all records for users exceeding X number of volume, etc. And I think Coinbase also did fight it, and there was ended up being some sort of compromise of the release of the data. So Gemini is another exchange that I think does that as well. Well, I say, I mean, in this case, it's, yeah, essentially it's, that, that, that's it. They get basically giving it over. There's no real compromise or anything. So I can't imagine many other exchanges going to fight <laughs> if it comes up. But um, it's like I say, it's like in, in Brazil where all exchanges have to every month provide the government with all information, of every transaction, even if it's like a cent. Um, and this is, this is going to become more and more prevalent. Uh, you've had like Janet Yellen warning people about rates increases. And so clearly these governments are clamping down on it. So I guess the warning point from this was, yeah, essentially, if you're using a centralized uh, exchange or a centralized body to purchase or sell cryptocurrency, it will end up in your government's hands, no matter what you want to think. So well, I'll on. caveat that a little bit. It will end up in a government's hands. But if you're using, you know, for example, if you're in, in uh, Venezuela, you, you don't care if your information gets to the U.S. government. You care right. if it gets to the Venezuelan government. So I think that's something that is playing out is there is a game of kind of if I'm a citizen of country X, then I'm going to use the services of an exchange or uh, in country Y, um, that type of thing. And so um, and as long as the governments of the world are not in perfect sync and, you know, they probably never will be. Not only do they have competing interests, but they're also just disorganized. Um, you'll see users kind of trying to leverage that. I see the lesson is uh, Russian exchanges. No, I'm joking. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a lesson. <laughs> but yeah, um, well, yeah, as I say, that was, just the, that was the main reason for bringing that piece up. It was just uh, making that point. Jerry, um, have you got any, uh, any news pieces you wanted to raise this week? Uh, yeah, um, pretty interesting news I saw today, about three hours ago. And that is um, NYDG announces appointment of John Dalby as chief CFO of, um, as their CFO. Um, NYDG, a leading provider of investment and technology solutions for Bitcoin today, announced the appointment of John Dalby as chief financial officer um, of Bridgewater Associates, um, the largest hedge fund in the world, by the way, which is um, pretty interesting. Um, and, it, you know, it's uh, it's been a, trend recently of um of uh, crypto companies hiring people from traditional finance you know you know into their companies and to try i think it's almost like you're preparing the common preparers for you know for for um basically the war that is going to you know come into the space and um many companies are prepare legally and you know otherwise you know in preparation for what's to come so I think it's validation for what's going on in Wall Street right now, which is major FOMO. You're probably right. Um, the NIDIG, I think it was uh, they're looking to provide um, the ability to purchase, hold, and sell cryptocurrencies within your bank's ecosystem uh, to, like, I think most US banks essentially, because obviously they're providing banking as a service to a lot of like high street banks. So most high street banks in the US sometime within the next year, I believe, was the was the, the sort of quote uh, that I saw in the news. So yeah, it's coming and uh, people are making the highest they need to make, aren't they? I mean, Binance are hiring like ex-regulatory officials because obviously there's quite a lot of governments looking at Binance Smart Chain and what they're up to. Um, and uh, also uh, I think it's, well, I think Ripple hired someone the other day who was like super ex influential they're always hiring people who have been influential as well and there's all these different companies that are constantly essentially hiring uh people with years and years of experience in regulation and who've got the contacts and yeah it just makes sense doesn't it really uh, it's not what you know it's who you know it's, uh... yeah i kind of, i kind of wonder um 
do these comp do these um you know players or you know people actually come to the space because they because of FOMO or do they actually believe in the future of the industry? Because if it's you know based on based off of FOMO, then you can I can expect the excitement would be pretty much you know short lived. Yeah, I I can't speak to these mega mega hedge funds and and things of that nature. Um, it's not my world that I ever understood, but. From what I've learned, I, I think that these uh, these big companies they do they have their own set of influencers. The people like you know Ray Dalio or um, uh, uh, Paul Tudor Jones, etc. These are like the legendary investors uh, over the past few decades. And when they say that they have a favorable opinion of Bitcoin, then a lot of these um, a lot of these companies start moving in in that direction. I think I think in general though the companies. Um, maybe if they don't believe in Bitcoin, they at least believe that the U.S. dollar uh, will perhaps uh, start declining because uh, of the massive amount of inflation. And so they're starting to look at options, um, something to transition to that is, that is scarce. Uh, so, yeah, uh, well, uh, we've discussed the news. Now is the time to uh, talk to Matt uh, a little bit and uh, just ask him some questions uh, and get to know him and obviously let everyone out there listening get to, get to know him a little bit, little bit better. Um, so I guess, yeah, I, I suppose the first, um, the first question, uh, I've got for you, um, is I guess at the moment, is there, like, are there any kind of like projects or things that you're working on or things that you can see being worked on that like you kind of think are awesome or you want to highlight to people who are listening? Is there anything out there that kind of sticks out to you before we kind of get to know you? It'd be interesting to see why kind of what makes you tick or what, what has your interest at the moment, I suppose. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I think. My life right now is, you know, um, growing BitRefill. I've, I've been with BitRefill um, kind of as a consultant type person for the last year. Um, and, you know, in that time I've grown closer and closer. And um, so most of the things that I'm excited about are just expanding um, the reach of BitRefill all around the world. I think we have like a super interesting set of customers um it's a it's an extremely global company um and our users are at the forefront of this uh, digital revolution of um, if i could say it in like a sentence it, it's it's the rise of the uh, of the sovereign individual in, in the digital world where you're going to have people from doesn't even matter what country they come from but they're finding ways to uh, trading crypto, they're finding ways to earn crypto, um, and uh, they are increasingly living off crypto. And I think that's just something that, I mean, uh, that phenomenon, it really could be, I mean, as crazy as it sounds, it could be one of the things that is written about in history books, like 200 years from now, that they, they would talk about this century was the century that kind of the nation states fell in power and individuals rose in power. Um, and so we're, we're kind of, you know, potentially on that path right now. And, and, and BitRefill as a company is like lit on, the, on the absolute bleeding edge. We're talking to the, to the pioneers, the trailblazers, the people who are actually starting to tiptoe into that livestock yeah yeah that's really cool like i uh yeah there's definitely exciting things that are going on with with us and what we're up to and um it's like yeah i i definitely i personally am like very pro the idea of like maintaining like cultures in areas you know like not losing like what makes like a country a country in a way like the, the core cultures like the foods and the but the different things people do but at the same time otherwise trying to kind of become like this kind of just a a global force basically with everyone kind of in a way united now obviously you know would that ever happen or not I, I don't know but yeah you're right like i like the idea of kind of well nations essentially losing their power as a nation and actually i was being able to be like hey i'm just someone who i i earn the global currency which is bitcoin or or another crypto if i choose and i just travel around and it doesn't really matter where i'm from basically um i like that idea a lot like a nationless citizen of the internet yeah, basically. I saw something the other, it's about a few months ago now. It's like, essentially, this is, I can't remember, I really can't remember what it was called, but they're trying to make essentially a nation online. 
So you kind of like have this passport and all this stuff. And at first I thought this is gimmicky, but then I thought it's actually quite a cool idea. Like you can kind of be a citizen of like this country that exists online. So you kind of have like your rules and your regulations. You'd pay kind of any taxes that you pay to this online kind of country. And obviously you'd have like a passport and it would give you the ability to like spend a certain amount of times in different countries. So then you can essentially be like, this is my passport. This is my country. It's like, <laughs> and I can kind of live wherever in the world and just kind of, I thought that's a really cool idea. Like having, instead of being your country being like the land you're from, you kind of almost choose like your country almost in a way Like you could just go online and be like, okay, there's 20 countries and they have different taxes, different benefits, different, you know, that'd be kind of cool um, to like choose where you're from. Um, so yeah, I quite yeah. like the idea of that. I, want, I wonder what the national anthem will sound like yeah that's a good point man <laughs> it's just it's just binary or it's like a it's the beeps from uh oh, what the bios in your computer it's just a bios beeping sound or something but um <laughs> yeah anyway as i say we'll, we'll move on from that but um i guess yeah uh without wanting to kind of like uh go too far off the, off the track i suppose obviously as you say you're spending a lot of time obviously i'm, I'm a bit refill and, and working on pushing it forward um but obviously something that you um have done in the past and you're still running is useful tulips um, and it'd be really cool because obviously I imagine people listening, obviously lots will know about it, lots won't. So like uh, give us like a little rundown of like, I guess first off, like what, what's it, what it's about, what you're trying to aim to do with that. And then obviously kind of what got you into it in the first place, like how you ended up getting into Useful Tulips and like coming up with the idea. Yeah, so Useful Tulips, it's kind of like a sarcastic name. Um, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of people in the traditional finance world who kind of liken cryptocurrencies to the tulip bulb um, uh, in, in the 17th century. And, and um, so uh, the fact that I call them useful tulips means that they're something other than that thing that happened hundreds of years ago. Um, and so the whole website is designed to showcase um, that there are people all around the world um, uh, that use cryptocurrency to solve problems, real world problems that they have um, they're using cryptocurrency to solve it, solve those things. Um, and the users of uh, cryptocurrency, the people using it to solve problems, they tend to come from countries that um, have a particular set of traits related to um, financial restrictions, um, capital controls, corruption, things of that nature. So uh, people from those countries are coming to Bitcoin uh, to uh, to get around a lot of the issues that are problematic in their own country. And so um, uh, that's kind of what uh, the website showcases data from two popular peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, Paxful and Local Bitcoins. Um, and I, I look at those, that data of those exchanges because the users on those exchanges come from these countries that, I've speak, that I'm speaking of. Um, and so I also write articles which kind of take a really deep look at the data to kind of explain to the general reader um, the intricacies of what's actually happening, uh, you know, beneath the surface. So yeah, that's, that's what the website is. It has uh, data charts on volumes in different countries, and it also has uh, articles and such that you can read and, and understand it more. Matt, I had a quick question. Do you plan to add the, any data from Binance's peer-to-peer -peer markets? Um, some of the Spanish podcast interviews I've been doing, uh, people have led me to believe that local Bitcoins has kind of lost a large portion of its market share to Binance's peer-to-peer -peer market. Yeah, I've heard the same thing. And unfortunately, um, Binance has to be willing to release that data for me to ever, you know, publish it. And I've asked them several times. Um, I even asked CZ himself and um, it's always, uh, you know, um, radio silence from their side. I think I, I think from a business standpoint, they have no reason to publish this data and um, they don't really want their competitors to see how much volume they're doing in what place, uh, not to mention the governments of those countries themselves. Um, so yeah, I'm not too optimistic about them releasing that data. And there are other heuristic ways that I could take a stab at getting that, um, but it would require a lot of work and it still wouldn't be that great of a guess so unfortunately i'm kind of limited by that and uh it really sucks because I, I i would love to to look into binance peer-to-peer -peer data what regions um are the most interesting to you uh as far as bit refill customers go i'm super 
bullish on the Latin American market. We seem to always be getting, you know, increasing numbers from that area. Um, and again, it's the type of people who they're not necessarily uh, using crypto because they, you know, they're just trading people. They're, they're, they're just speculative investors. They're, a lot of the times they're using crypto because like it's solving some sort of problem, some sort of cross-border shipment or, or like getting a product in their local country at, at a slightly better price than they could normally get it. You know, using their online cryptocurrency, there's a lot of very educated people in Latin America who they're very highly skilled workers um, and they're making money uh, by working for US corporations or working for companies in Europe and things of that nature. And they're looking for a way to kind of offload their crypto earnings. And so um, all that, all those types of use cases are super interesting. Um, I'm always forever bullish on, um, you know, or interested in the things that are happening in West Africa as well. Um, you know, BitRefill, we don't have as much success in West Africa and I've studied that for a long time. I think I'm starting to figure out the reasons why we just don't have the, the best offering of products there at the best possible prices. Um, so we're continuing to look into that. Um, you know, Southeast Asia is another very, you know, any, any up and coming market is, is uh, very interesting. It, it, you know, it, it's not even just the, which region is interesting, it's just that because there really are a lot of similarities across all regions that are up and coming in the world. Um, they all have a lot of the similar problems in there. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's just this like, we're just watching this globalization happen where you have nations of uh, citizens of one country, they want products from another country, or they want, they want this online digital, uh, digital item that is typically only available to people of certain other countries. So it's just really fascinating to me to look into all that stuff. I gotcha. Like, uh, I agree on the Latin America side of things. Like, um, it's definitely, uh, it definitely seems more exciting to me, like Bitcoin and the impact it can have over there um, compared to UK or US, just simply because of the, the ease of transacting and the ease of having your money in a bank in the UK and in the US is generally a lot sort of better basically than it is in, in, in a lot of Latin American countries in general. So uh, I definitely am more excited on that one. Yesterday we did a, a podcast in Spanish with uh, Jorge from Bitcoin beach, the yeah. guy you recommended to go? me, Matt. It was awesome. It was awesome. Um, it's really inspiring what they're doing in Bitcoin beach with, with Bitcoin. Um, they basically have like 80 different businesses in this tiny little community all accepting Bitcoin and Lightning. And then also the, the Bitcoin that they're receiving, they're selling it, you know, at like market rates to exchange it back for fiat and stuff so that other people in the community can get Bitcoin and trade their dollars or whatever. And um, it's just like created a whole circular economy, which was really inspirational because um, it's it seems like it's one of the more like advanced places where they've created a Bitcoin community where people are actually using it as a medium of exchange. It's not like just to hodl and, and preserve your wealth from inflation. They're actually like spending it, buying groceries with it, um, you know, paying for gas, going to, uh, out to eat to a restaurant, um, that kind of thing. So that was really, really cool. And then uh, he was saying that they made their own wallet, which is super user-friendly. So like even old ladies and like children can use the Lightning Network and, and buy groceries and stuff with it. You're mentioning Bitcoin Beach is in El Salvador. It's like a small surf town, right, uh, type thing. Um, but uh, my question is, is like they have received a lot of attention and they're getting a lot of money from the outside world, right? But is that sustainable? And because you you said like they're forming a circular economy. Well, my my main hard question to ask you is like, well, are they earning Bitcoin? Are they earning, uh, you know, um, are they doing work that's acquiring Bitcoin? And, and is that side of it all like starting to show or not? Like, is this all just going to run out when, when the interest fades or, or what? Well, as Jorge described it, they're working with some foundations, like some international foundations that are donating money and resources to the project. Um, they also have like a tourism um, influx of people that are Bitcoiners that want to go to Bitcoin Beach and hang out and spend their Bitcoin and, and have a nice, you know, vacation. And then he said that. Um, well, can you go to? A, is there is there 
uh, an Airbnb where you can pay in Bitcoin or, or something like that? It, does that exist right now? Because that would be a way, that would be a, an answer this to my question. In, yeah, there's like 80 different businesses that are um, accepting Bitcoin. And he says daily, there's like two or three more per day that are being added. And then also uh, he said that there's around 75 people, I think he said, that are actually earning wages in Bitcoin working for, for some of these companies that are participating in the program. So um, right now it may not be sustainable, but as he describes it, it is moving in that direction. Like people are starting to earn their, their money in Bitcoin. And he said that um, because of the notoriety of Bitcoin Beach within El Salvador, like outside of Bitcoin Beach and, and El Zonte where, where that's taking place, like in other regions in the country, like there's businesses, like a, a lot of them that are starting to accept Bitcoin and um, it's starting to grow like outside of, of where the project is. So. That's the key, right? Like if you can get it to spread out of like almost not necessarily jealousy, but oh, well, they're doing it and it's working. We need to do it. If they can get to spread within that country, if you can get the whole country somehow generally accepting and paying in Bitcoin, that's that's when you've kind of really made it sustainable. Because like as soon as you enter that country, boom. And, uh, and also it doesn't matter like if, you know, if you're a restaurant in, uh, in one area and you need to get a cow from another area to make burgers, it doesn't matter if the price in the local currency is up or down because you're all using Bitcoin anyway. So it doesn't matter if Bitcoin compared to the dollar is up or down because you're all using it. So it does not make a difference. The only thing that would matter would be for exports, right? And so uh, anything you're bringing in from, sorry, imports, sorry, not exports, imports would be the only place where, it, well, one of the only places where it would matter, like, um, that, you know, if you're holding, if you're earning and holding and spending Bitcoin in El Salvador, then um if you want to buy a PlayStation from the U S or something, that's when it's going to, you know, Oh, well, last year it was like three quarters of the price or a quarter of the price or something. And now it's like way more expensive or way cheaper. That'd be the only time you'd have to care. Right. So that's the key. I think is expanding. I don't know anything about El Salvador. So I want to ask just a really stupid uh, American question that, that an American would ask about El Salvador uh, that I wonder if, if you asked, uh, um, I forget what his name was, who you talked to, um, Jorge, right? So uh, El Salvador has like these big organized crime type of activities, right? So have they have they had those types of organized crime kind of like start moving into this surf town that seems to be making a lot of money and such? And like, has that been an issue or? Uh, I didn't, I didn't ask him about um, organized crime or anything like that but i i do i am familiar with the problems that you're talking about and it is a huge problem in el salvador um one interesting point that he did bring up was that el salvador doesn't have their own like national currency they're a dollarized country like they had uh economic crisis probably like 20 years ago and they switched to the dollar so um for them to make the transition in their own currency so um bitcoin is kind of like playing like a role of the currency of the people as, as Jorge described it. Less alien, I suppose, right? Like uh, if you've already switched to another currency anyway, and it's not necessarily your like national currency, then it's less alien for you to just switch to another. So here's another uh, question I have, like in terms of being skeptical of the, the idea of Bitcoin, you know, Strike is down there in El Salvador and they provide dollar wallets for people, right? So, and it is already a dollarized country. So what are the chances that I'm sure this is already happening to a large degree where people are just using strike wallets to transact dollars and Bitcoin's not even involved really, uh, except for that, like that instant where, so ev as far as I understand, even within strike, when you're transferring from a dollar to dollar account, like it converts to lightning for a moment and then converts back to dollars. Um, so my question is, is like, is it possible that, you know, strike will simply like dollarize the country even more, and, and Bitcoin will be kind of like left on the sidelines almost. Like, are they? He actually did. He did mention that Strike Bitcoin? was super popular because of that, because it keeps it in dollars. So, like, even if there's volatility, like your dollar balance doesn't change. And then right. also, people are familiar with the dollar as like a unit of account and stuff, so it's easier for them to use them to start trying to calculate prices and sats. So yeah, I mean, like, it's very possible. Like, I question how much they're actually denominating in Bitcoin and how much they would denominate trade transact like 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 lauren said you know they're buying livestock from the other side of the country they would almost always do that in dollars you know i don't believe they would be 
denominating those purchases in Bitcoin. And I struggle to see how that could start to happen unless the dollar falls apart, you know, on a global level. So it doesn't really matter, though, because um, I think, you know, it would, you know, it, it, it will take a pretty long while and a huge, you know, a huge, you know, shift in um, orientation before people basically become less, you know, USD oriented. Um, and I think, you know, people, um, the dollarization of, you know, uh, economies, especially in, um, in, um, in societies or in um, lo lo uh, communities such as a Bitcoin beach will continue to be, you know, become the norm. Even in Nigeria here that I am, um, people who transact using Bitcoin, are, you know, they think, they don't think of, you know, using Bitcoin as Bitcoin. They see it as a way to move USD. So the dollarization problem is basically everywhere. And it's take, you know, a pretty long while before, before, for people to become less, you know, dollarized in the way that they, you know, transact. I guess the way you do that though, surely, right, is, is by, I guess, as I say, if you see a certain community as they are, I guess, seeing Bitcoin Beach accepting and Bitcoin spending and it's working and like generally the, and the, and the, and the not the cost of living, the um, quality of life is, is getting better in that area and you're from outside that area, the way you're going to start to join the Bitcoin kind of forces by seeing that and going, well, damn, I want some of that. So we're going to start accepting it. And then they start accepting it. And then it's like, well, if that starts working, so I mean, so like, I guess the, the, the way you do that is by having a lot of outside help as well, right? Like maybe if you held a Bitcoin conference in El Salvador and you kind of brought a lot of tourism in and they're spending it and they're wanting it. And, and then that way, that's kind of the way, the only way I can really see it happening is like it's spreading from a small area in El Salvador out through to the rest of it and then constant tourism and attempts to like help that get better would be then it becomes more of a sensible thing to start doing bitcoin only because well that's what people who are coming with the money from outside the country want to do they want to spend their bitcoin and so that would make more sense right you're going to make more money by accepting it therefore why would i accept dollars why would i want to you know use dollars that's the only way i could see it happening is that kind of incentive of like it's just better for me i get more money this way matt do you think it matters that they're using the dollar as like the pricing mechanism and unit of account if they're using bitcoin as a payment rail like behind the scenes yeah i do think it matters because well it matters if you're asking does it matter from the perspective of will that cause the number of bitcoin, the price of bitcoin to go up yeah if, if they're only using bitcoin at these split second transactions and then other than that they're automatically switching into dollars and they're never really holding bitcoin except for that moment of transaction and i think that would that's hugely impactful i think um so um in my mind the transition i think what lawrence is saying has some merit but i still think that like it's not going to it's going to be something that happens to the dollar that would really cause this stuff to take to take off it's going to be it's going to be this like critical event in the, in the history of the dollar where you know it loses x x percent of value in a single day and it'll be like this historical event and then all of a sudden it'll be this like free for all of currencies that everyone wants you know like i've got these currencies i've got those currencies and then in that chaos somehow bitcoin becomes the most the most popular one for some reason because it's open source and everybody can connect into it etc but um yeah it i it's a huge uphill battle because i think the the interest of the united states and i think they're figuring this out now is that um, they it's in their interest to dollarize the world so it's in their interest to not censor transactions unless it's somebody that they really hate they would love for people in El Salvador and in Nigeria to use, to transact in dollars because that allows the U.S. to like exert their influence across the world and also print more money, by the way. So I think as they continue to figure that out, they're going to make the dollar more and more user friendly on a global scale. And that's going to and it already is starting to cut in on, on Bitcoin's appeal in that in that area. Yeah, I mean, that that's a valid point that you bring up because Tether has like a huge role. Uh, mm -hmm. being like a like a pseudo dollar that people are are using um you know permissionlessly yeah so uh, i do think that uh, one of the reasons why um um it might take a while for bitcoin to become you know more you know as, as dominant as the us dollar is is because of volatility 
I think um, people in these places, you know, um, they do not like, or, or how would I put it? They, they're not comfortable with Bitcoin's volatility. And, and that makes, you know, Bitcoin unattractive to them as a way of moving USD as against just moving USD itself if you do have USD. So even for that split circle where they move USD, for instance, for OTC traders, people who trade OTC, there's something they call the lock, they call, you know, locking in rates. If you're trading Bitcoin OTC and you want to buy from, you know, someone peer to peer and they tell you this is the rate I'm buying um, USD from you and based on the current um, USD Naira rate and they lock that rate and that rate is um, locked in for like, I think 10 to 15 um, minutes pending, you know, when you pay. After that, you know, the payment, after that um, um, window, you know, expires, then the deal, and you haven't paid the deals off. So I, that volatility needs to present the problem. If you're trying to move money, you know, across the country or you're receiving payment and Bitcoin makes, you know, five, you know, three, four, you know, 10% moves in. If you're a merchant, it's not really, you know, um, it's not really ideal. Will Bitcoin become more stable? Uh, in its value? Will it become less volatile? And, and what has to happen for that to happen? And if you ask the monetary theorists about that, they will say that Bitcoin's fixed issuance is actually a weakness in that respect, because with, with all these other fiat currencies, their issuance is variable in that when the, when the value of the, of the currency drops, they can restrict supply by, by issuing less money. And then when the value increases, they can uh, increase supply at the central bank. And that is a stabilizing factor. Bitcoin does not have that going for it. And so from that respect, it will be very hard for Bitcoin to overcome its volatility. But at the same time, I believe that there are many more factors that lead to the stability of a certain uh, asset in, in uh, a big one is just the fact that if on a daily basis, people are transacting it regardless of its price, kind of like Lauren said, if, if prices of products are actually starting to be denominated in Bitcoin, then on any given day, commerce is going to happen at a given, you know, X amount of Bitcoin rate that that increases stability. I'm not sure if I'm um, uh, articulating that um, the best, but the more people use it as a transactional medium, that has this kind of dimming effect on the uh, trading volatility where people think it's going to the moon or going to zero. Um, that's kind of the point that I'm trying to make. Um, and also just the good old like stickiness of prices when, when you're at a grocery store and you know you have a label that says this product is $1, there's a stickiness to that price in that it's work to change the price, right? So you have to go and put a new sticker on there. So if, if, if um, Bitcoin becomes that unit of, of, uh, that, that things are priced in, it will have that stickiness as well. So like a, a can of soup is 100 Satoshis, it actually takes a cognitive load for the store to update that price. And so um, uh, there's, uh, it's likely that, that 100 Satoshis per can of soup is going to stay there. I think this goes down to the whole, you know, value chain of, you know, of, you know, of commerce, you know, stand. And in the way that, you know, you pay the merchant, the merchant probably has supplies, he has to pay. And the fact that he has to convert to fiat probably set to some bills or, you know, to restock the supplies. I think that therein lies the issue. There has, the whole value chain has to be, you know, the, uh, the, the, the economics or the transaction from the whole value chain has to be denominated in Bitcoin for, us to achieve stability, not just between the merchant and the customer, but yeah. also between the the supplier, the from the people who are into the production. It the whole thing just has to go all the way up and from from bottom to top, from top to bottom. So, I think therein lies the issue. If we are able to achieve that, then volatility, uh, then up there's definitely we are probably going to see stabilization or even hyper Bitcoinization, which, whichever comes first. The core, I guess, of what you're saying is that like, if it well, essentially, okay, if you said tomorrow, suddenly Bitcoin, everyone in the entire world, well, not even that, okay, everyone in the UK only uses Bitcoin, only transacts in Bitcoin, only earns Bitcoin. No one in the UK, well, most people in the UK, 90% at least, couldn't give a damn, quite frankly, what the value of it is compared to the dollar. Because as you, as you said, Matt, like if a can of soup in Tesco's is 
that many satoshis then a can of soup is that many satoshis it's only when you then start like going oh i need to send my friend out in spain something where then you might care but for general everyday life you couldn't give a damn so that's where it's only volatile in comparison to something right which in this case is fiat currencies um so once you get rid of the fiat currencies then it's not volatile anymore unless you're going to compare it to gold but then if you compare fiat to gold then i mean arguably there's some volatility there less than bitcoin but yeah. for the whole value chain to switch over to satoshis like jerry is saying um you guys don't see the first steps uh like kind of a, as the use case that uh bill barheit the guy from abra described where like abra is basically offering a bunch of financial products to people that they can't invest in normal markets because they don't have like AML KYC or whatever. So they invest in collateralized Bitcoin markets where you're buying like stock or whatever, but it's really Bitcoin. That's the underlying payment rail, kind of like what strikes doing with dollars. Um, you guys don't see that as like the first step to switching the value chain over uh, to a Satoshi based value chain, like the collateralization of existing markets um, in Bitcoin. I do. I, I think it's. it's a, I, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of like gradual steps that need to be made, right? And obviously that is one of them. Um, and nothing's going to happen suddenly, right? Like we've gone through uh, quite a few little phases of like the beginning of the currency, right? Like at first Bitcoin was just a hobby, and it was that kind of ah, oh, I got Bitcoin, like, and, and that was like that's where it was there. And then we're kind of moving now uh, through into that kind of like medium of exchange side of things. And obviously then comes the unit of account. So. We got we got a lot to go through, but yeah, I think you're right. Like using Bitcoin in the background and as you say, collateralizing is a is a big step towards yeah. uh, towards that. But it's it's um, you know, it's only going to take one event um, uh, when that collateral is not enough, and then it's just going to be an industry wide like black day, you know, where it's like, oh, Abra couldn't pay its bills because the Bitcoin price changed too much in one day, and then that's going to like set set that movement back for 10 years you know um i actually was a early customer of abra and i remember during one particular bitcoin drop they wouldn't let me withdraw my money um so as much as they advertise that they're you know able to do this stuff like it doesn't actually you know there are problems also the, the other point i want to make is that when you when you have Collateral is expensive in that you have to set aside capital and just have it do nothing uh, in order for you to, you know, so that's like a bit, it's the same thing with the Lightning Network. You have to like spend Bitcoin just to open up channel capacity. So it's like, it just has to sit there. You have to spend $2 before you even spend your first dollar. You know what I mean? So that, that sunken cost of like Bitcoin <coughs> collateral layer, that's, uh, I don't believe it's not going to happen. I just think it's a challenge for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I do think so. I think one one of the ways we could achieve that stabilization is if, and I've had and I've you know, thought about this for a while. I think it's when companies start paying employees in Bitcoin. I think that because one of the reasons, people, you know, it's 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 not really convenient for you to buy Bitcoin to spend Bitcoin. But it's always easier to spend Bitcoin when you're earning Bitcoin because Bitcoin is all you have and you have to spend to live. So I think if and uh, I think if it's done that I think there are companies who actually facilitate facilitate you know the paying of employees in Bitcoin. I I can't remember put a name to it right now, but I think there are about a couple of them that let you pay you know employees in Bitcoin. I think that way, you know, we will start to see the distribution of Bitcoin. You know move even faster and once you know merchants begin to have more bitcoin then they can convince more you know suppliers to you know, begin to take bitcoin because right now it's basically it becomes you know quite popular so that for me is one way i think we could you know this could speed up the whole process a whole lot faster so, something to remember as well though right like um we're talking about this but you gotta remember that, like okay how old is bitcoin right well, 12, must be nearing 12 years or whatever. Well, let me think. Yeah, whatever. I don't know. I'm not great at maths. 11, 12 years, whatever. You know, just over a decade old. But okay. And that's a, a people powered coin or token, right? So if you think of the euro, right? And I was obviously, I grew up when and, and before the euro existed. And then obviously, as I was growing up, the euro came. That took 10 years for them to prepare, just, just to prepare for the euro. Then it took them three years for it to just be like used 
kind of in the background for like electronic payments and accounting, kind of like as you said, Abra's using it, right? Like it's this kind of like thing that you don't really see as a, as a consumer. Then they released it in 2002, three, whenever, I think it was 2002. Um, and you had, I think I was 12 countries were fully supporting that, right? So this is, it took them 13 years just to get to that point of everyone using it with 12 countries full support and like legal requirement for you to use it. So the fact that we're this far on without any legal requirement and without any government support is bloody impressive is what I'm going to say, um, to be honest. I mean, it's, it's done well as an experiment. And I think that's something we need to remember is like currencies take a long time to get going, even if they have like full government support, um, which we don't have. So um, and the euro as well wasn't that stable in the first couple of years either. And so, you know, there's there's loads more to think about there. But um, yeah, sorry, I don't want to drag the podcast on too long. Is there anything anyone wanted to kind of ask or talk about um, more or are we good? Oh, it was a good okay. conversation. Yeah, as I say, there's more I want to ask you as well, Matt. So we'll probably have to ask you to come back on in like a, a month or so's time and uh, badger you to, <laughs> to have you on again. But um, yeah, I say, I mean, what we'll do is we always leave it on um, just some like good news. Um, so I've got some good news prepared to read out to people so that they can leave the podcast on a happy note. But um, yeah, before we do that, obviously appreciate you coming on and taking the time out of your day. And uh, I appreciate the listeners as well for listening to our ramblings. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll read out the good news uh, now. So first, uh, here we go. The Duke of Burgundy's butterfly has been saved from extinction by farmers in the UK recently. Uh, and in studying dandelion seeds, scientists have discovered an entirely new form of air bubble called the separated vortex ring, which allows it to fly great distances and can be used for many, many purposes uh, in humanity. India's richest man has retooled his factories to provide free oxygen in one in, to one in 10 COVID patients across the country. A sailing vessel has been created which feeds on plastic waste from the ocean for power whilst cleaning the oceans. The world's first laundry detergent made from industrial carbon emissions has been launched by Unilever. Australia has announced a $100 million initiative to protect our oceans. A microplastics breakthrough appears to have been made with a method to trap and remove them being created by scientists. And finally, after a four-year-old's beloved toy tractor was stolen, compassionate cops have managed to replace it for him in the United States of America. There you go. So that's some positive news to leave everyone on there. Um, but yeah, let's say thanks for thanks for coming in, Matt. Thanks everyone for listening. Uh, we love you all, and just remember to buy some Bitcoin. Okay.